Well, welcome to a course on the IBM I Primer. This is a presentation that I actually put together a few years ago for an old client of mine. He asked me to create a course for their management team because there was a lot of confusion within their company about what the machines they were and the management team that was non-technical didn't understand the technology or the phrases that were, that were being used in various meetings. Um, this was exacerbated for this particular client because the users tended to call their IBM I system the 400. The uh, techies in the um, support team called it the I series, and yet all the developers called it either the I, the IBM I, or the AS400. And they were just totally confused about what machine was and, and what. So, anyway, I'm waffling. So I put together this presentation. So here is a brief history of the IBM I system. Um, and we're going to talk about the originating systems in this, this chain of machines, the IBM System 3X machines. They were replaced by the venerable AS400 in the late 80s, early 90s, which was replaced by the I-Series machine in the very late 90s, around the turn of the century. That makes it sound really old, doesn't it? Turn of the century. Um, then came the System I in the early noughts, and then the current machine that you're running right now, the IBM Power System, running the IBM I operating system, which was introduced, I think, in 2008. So we're going to kind of touch on all of those things and hopefully um, wipe away some of the confusion and give you a nice overview. This is going to be non-technical. I'm keeping it that way. I want you to watch this presentation maybe an hour and come out of it knowing what the machine is and just having a good idea of what it's capable of so that you can understand what you see in meetings. Um, and for techies, it's just a nice piece of history because we're all nerds underneath everything else. Alrighty, that's it. Let's dive straight in. Let's start with module one. It's always good to start at the beginning and we'll have a brief high level overview of the history of IBM I systems. So, um, the IBM I operating system has evolved from older machines like the System 38, the AS400 and the I series. So this little presentation for Module 1, we're going to discuss the basics of the computer system's history, its hardware and architecture and database. And then finally, we'll have a slightly deeper delve into using IBM I. I'll probably add some screencasts of logging on to a terminal and actually going through some basic commands to show you how it works. And maybe we'll have a look at the system security and user profile functions. Um, maybe I'll even add a final section looking at web services and web servers. Um, but I'll probably break those into a later presentation that are a bit more technical. This overview is for anyone, even if you've got no computing knowledge. What I want you to come out of this course with is when you're in a meeting and someone says the AS400 or the i-series, you'll know what they're talking about. And you'll be able to correct them as well. So where did these machines start? Um, first of all, I've used very loose years because you know technology takes a long time to develop and it's released. Some records will say, for example, the first System 3 was 1967. Some will say it's 69, some will say it's 70. So I've looked at all the records and just picked up on a rough date that I think is a good one so you can see things, the chronology of how the systems evolved. So back in 1969, not the summer of love. Um, it was the summer of the IBM System 3. So in the early 60s, IBM had started a secret project codenamed Tiny. And the idea was to create a computer with a smaller footprint than their huge mainframe systems. Back in those days, mainframe computer systems filled rooms with hardware. You know, they were the size of a single story dwelling. So by 1969, this first tiny computer system, the IBM System 3, was launched. And they were kind of aiming it at smaller businesses. Um, not one-man bands, but, you know, smaller to mid, um, small to medium-sized companies that wanted a computer system to store their data. Wind forward about five years or so. In 1975, the next model, the IBM System 32, was released by IBM. This was a 16-bit single-user system, also known as the IBM 5320. IBM described this as the first system to incorporate hardware and comprehensive application software, which is kind of what we're, at, we're doing now, even on the modern machines. Everything's all bundled together into one box. 
So this machine was smaller than the room size machines, as you can see from the little graphic up there, but it's still a hefty piece of kit. Now, about two or three years later, in 77, was the first real step into the, the shape of the modern machines that we're playing with. Their customer base at the time had liked the original IBM System 3 and other customers like the System 32. So IBM released the IBM System 34. And basically it had two processors built into it. One based on the System 32 and the other based on the System 3. So you could switch modes between the two. This also featured an offline storage mechanism that utilized magazines, boxes of 8-inch floppies. Now, when I started working back in the late 80s on the System 38, I'm digressing here by the way those were my first storage it was the old tape reel to reels and these big magazines where you put boxes of floppy disks in um, about the size of a, a slightly smaller than an album cover on an lp and they would store data pretty impressive stuff at the time so system 34 was very well received and then wind forward a few years into the late 70s on the cusp of 1980 in 1979 ibm launched the System 38. This thing was groundbreaking. Codenamed Pacific, um, the System 38 was oriented towards a multiple user environment with dozens of terminals and a whopping 60 megabytes of storage. Uh, unfortunately, it suffered from performance problems because the architecture of the machine was too demanding of the hardware of the era. Now, what I mean by that is the dream of what the machine could do the hardware and technology for making computer bits that went into the machine wasn't advanced enough. So it was trying to do things way more advanced than the hardware could deliver. So I remember it being plagued with outages. The system would crash. Um, the operating system would dump. Um, so everyone loved what it did. The fact that it had all these multiple users was amazing. But it had a lot of teething problems. Now, those teething problems were ironed out over the first couple of years. CPF, its operating system, was regularly released. And then if we wind forward to 1983, the IBM System 36 was born. That's right. IBM went System 3, System 34, System 38, hmm, System 36. So <laughs> the trouble with the... 36 was they made it smaller and leaner and they tried to make a smaller faster version of the system 38 and it was a victim of its own success smaller businesses loved the system 36 uh, the footprint of the thing was like a big fat suitcase um, but it had multiple consoles plugged into it dual processors 8 megahertz processors leading edge and it had its own solid internally designed database and you could write code for it using RPG2 and a thing called the logic cycle. Um, all old and very, very basic, but it kind of saw everything that they, we wanted to do with it back in the day. Now, we had these two machines, the 36 and the 38, both serving different ends of this small to medium uh, marketplace. So IBM carried on their development and the AS400 was introduced in 1988. The 400... Um, doubled the performance of the System 38 and quadrupled five times. Is that quadruple? No, that's four. It quintupled. It was five times faster than the System 36. And it did everything that the 36 and the 38 did. So one of the huge benefits of the hardware being released with this incredible, super fast technology was that the operating system called OS 400 came with a whopping over 2,000 applications available from partners and software houses and unprecedented education courses and support. So you could buy this machine off the shelf, plug it in, you could back up and restore your old data from System 38 or System 36 machines and you could buy off the shelf applications, merge the data in and be up and running. It was amazing for the time. Uh, the AS400, the, this, the, the machine itself, became the world's most widely used mid-range computer system. It was a booming success. Right from its launch, the AS400 came with all kinds of configurations, but every year saw a new model being released with ever-increasing performance figures. And this was because hardware manufacturers 
kept making the machine faster and faster by increasing limits on the hardware. It was a real uh, upward tick on the, the curve of technology being and hardware being invented. They even made a portable AS400, uh, like your laptop size, but it was more like a, a luggable rather than a portable because it was the size of a, um, a briefcase, a fat, fat briefcase. Um, by the end of the 1990s, IBM reported it shipped more than 250,000, a quarter of a million AS400s around the world. Pretty amazing stuff by the end of the 90s. However, we were on the cusp of a brand new machine. With 2000 came the IBM i-Series. This was the next evolution of the AS400 platform. Brand new hardware and a brand new machine. So IBM had woken up to the fact that during this roaring success of the AS400, this thing called the internet had appeared. And they recognized that the internet was going to be groundbreaking for businesses all over the planet. So they released some brand new, uh, brand new server hardware, the IBM i-Series, um, still running uh, its version of OS 400, but increasing to a 64-bit architecture so it could address more storage. Um, again, faster and faster and faster hardware. So, And it came with lots of internet stuff in there. It came with a, a web server and PHP and all of the connectivity um, applications that you needed to let these machines talk to other machines anywhere on the planet. However, the new i-Series model was kind of fuzzily rebranded. The i-Series had its new sleek black styling and this sleek, fast internet server tools. But it never really caught on, I, th I feel, with a community of mid-range users and programmers. I think because lots of people would upgrade from an old AS400 creamy behemoth of machine, put in their sleek, sexy little black... Uh, IBM i-Series, restore all their AS400 applications and turn it on. The users would come into work on a Monday morning and they wouldn't notice any difference apart from saying, oh, the computer feels a bit faster than usual today. Um, business as usual. Um, I think IBM missed a huge opportunity in marketing here. This was the early internet days and IBM really could have promoted the i-Series as the web server for modern business and they just didn't really do it. They sat back on their laurels resting on the success of the IBM AS400. For example, I remember seeing IBM AS400 commercials on TV um, when IBM were really pushing the machine. And once it became very successful, they just stopped broadcasting them. And I've never ever seen an IBM i-Series or an IBM um, power system commercial on the television. Or even on YouTube or modern, you know, online social media. So... Because the machine wasn't seen, it was sitting in the back room, and the end users were still using their terminals, and they were still green screen, and the applications looked and felt the same. Even though this new machine was called the i-Series, many of the operating system menus and programming screens still said things like AS400 main menu. <laughs> of course, the green screens all looked the same. There was simply no difference for the large majority of the end users. Many people continue to call the machine the 400 because they've become fond of it. And this naming error even sticks in many businesses today. How many of your companies are calling your back office computer system an AS400? Hmm? I bet there's a few out there still. The AS400 was discontinued 20 years ago. It was discontinued in the last century. <laughs> it makes me feel old. I guess I am, it's true. So, the AS4, AS400 was, re was replaced by the i-Series, and as further hardware improvements led us onto the next hardware jump and another fuzzy rebranding from IBM, the IBM System I was launched in 2006. Some models called the e-Server i-Series, and some models were called the System i5, or just the System i. This was running an integrated operating system branded as i5OS. Again, it still looked and felt just like the old OS 400 operating system. And the uh, early models of the System I were very successful at doing its job. It ran your business. It controlled super fast internet connections. But with a new major evolution just around the corner, the System I was really kind of the last hurrah for the venerable uh, AS 400 line. So, 
what came after the System I in 2006. 2008 saw the introduction of the power system. Now, the power system is the hardware, and the big step here is A, completely new hardware running these huge um, boxes that ran from, you know, big mainframe size, super powerful machines down to small rack mounted machines that you put into your server next to a Windows server. A power system is capable of running multiple operating systems on it. Just like on your Windows machines, you might have what are called virtual machines or logical partitions. You can install multiple versions of an operating system inside the same hardware. So with the launch of the power system, IBM announced this new unified product line, IBM Power Systems, and it has support for AIX, and Linux as well as IBM i. IBM i is the latest evolution of the old OS 400 operating system. IBM i looks and feels like um, OS 400, very very familiar on the screens, but it just has tons of extra power and commands packed into it. So on your machine you can have multiple multiple partitions running all of these different operating systems, or you can just have one operating system, or you can have multiple versions of the same operating system. For example, let's say that you had a development system and you wanted to create a test system. You wouldn't have to go and buy another computer system. You just create another logical partition in the hardware and uh, install IBM I on that partition as well. So it would look to you as an end user like you've got two IBM I systems to log on to. Um, but in fact, they're both running on the same piece of hardware. The hardware itself has lots of other benefits. It, the database is controlled by DB2, I'm sure you've heard of that, and that supports all the modern internet protocols like XML um, and has terrific security, including column level encryption. You can encrypt and decrypt data on the fly as it's written into the database to keep all of your sensitive and personal identifying information secure. It has high availability, the IBM's tool, I think it's called Power HA, and this has got uh, synchronous or asynchronous mirroring and level switching. What that means is that as you write something, some data to your main machine or update something, it's almost instantaneously mirrored to your backup machine. So if your main computer site is struck by a, a meteor, you can switch over to your backup with as little uh, business uh, interruption as possible. Um, virtualization running in the different petitions I'm gonna skip through these because I promise not to get too technical uh, solid state drives you'll be aware of this that moving from the old whirring Winchester hard drives we now have solid state on everything which a is much faster B has much less is much more resilient much less chance of it breaking because there's no moving parts um, solid states are just the future right um, it has open access for RPG RPG is the main programming language and open access is an enhancement to RPG that lets RPG talk to external systems. They could be systems on the internet. So directly within your program, you can talk to a web browser or some web technology or a Windows application running somewhere. Uh, IBM I comes with Zend Server, which is a PHP web server. It's preloaded in the operating system. You can have your web server or uh, your web service server up and running literally in minutes. I know because I've done it lots of times. And it has a systems director built into lots of the tools. IBM finally realized, hey, the management doesn't want to be looking at reams of paper that have been printed on old, um, huge tractor driven printers. They want to see nice graphical graphs of what the system's up to. What's, you know, what's your storage like? What, what are the reasonings behind an upgrade that you want to do? Systems Director is pretty neat. So, what is an IBM I system? The hardware is called the IBM Power System, and the operating system within that hardware is called IBM I. In the olden days, you, you can compare this directly to the old hardware for the first generation was the Application System 400, the AS400, and it ran an operating system called OS400, Operating System 400. IBM comes with all of this integrated architecture ready to use out of the box. 
So it has a relational database manager, that's DB2. It has a thing called object-based architecture. What that means is everything on the machine is an object. Every single bit of software, every file, program, um, data area, they're all called objects and they all talk to each other. They're little separate things that you can move around. I'm gonna keep struggling to keep this high level. It has really good system security and, and auditing. As I've mentioned previously, it has its own built-in web server. Uh, secure network filing, uh, file sharing, and so much more is second to none. Uh, it has. It used to be advertised that it was military grade encryption. Um, well, because it was, because the military were using this machine, and lots of people have said this machine has never been hacked. Uh, I'm not sure if that's true or not. So, what makes this machine so popular? Well, it's got proven hardware. We, I mean, if I'm recording this in 2020, so we've already got nearly 30 years, well, over 30 years of, of, of history of this machine evolving and growing. It's got a huge list of ready-made business applications that you buy off the shelf, you install, that unlike, you know, this year's new Windows server application, these are things that have been around for decades with millions and millions of dollars of development time spent on them. It's got a flexible architecture which is entirely focused on business computing. And when I say flexible, you can add and remove parts of the hardware as the system grows or as you want to cut it back. If you want to add a new logical partition to your hardware, you can just put in some extra processors and click in some new disks. It does some really nice things as well. The scalability of the hardware means it's very easy to do this, adding and removing things. But also one of the wonderful things that I really like about IBM I is that, for example, the power system, if it noticed, um, I don't know, let's say it noticed that one of the drives was failing, it will actually, it can be set up to automatically go, oh, I can see there's an error happening, there's a read error on this drive it will move the data off that drive onto one of its other drives. All seamlessly, you end users won't even see it happening. It will just be moved to other drives. And when the drive's empty, it can send you a message to your operator saying, you know, drive XYZ has failed, remove it, order this part from IBM. Um, so they go in and just pull that drive out. The machine's up, it's running, no one notices anything different. When you get your new hard drive arrive, which could be, you know, twice the storage, 10 times the storage, you plug it back into that hole, tell the operating system to start using that disk, it will prepare it and just flood the data back onto the disk again, all while the machine's running um, without upset to any of your business. It's pretty good stuff. So IBM I is a modern operating system, but it's fully backwards compatible to your old AS400 and i-series applications but that does not mean it's an AS400. It is not an AS400, it's not an i-series. You have a power system running the IBM i operating system. Um, okay, I think I'm gonna stop there, that's long enough, and that takes us on to module two, which will be coming up shortly.